Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the use of facial recognition technology continues to grow at a breathtaking pace and is now seeped in to nearly every aspect of our daily lives. Many families are unaware that their faces are being mined as they walk through the mall, the aisles of the grocery store as they enter their homes or apartment complexes, and even as they drop their children off at school. In response, several municipalities, including within the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, which I represent, Somerville and Cambridge respectively, have stepped up to the plate to protect their residents from this technology. We know that the logical end of surveillance is often over-policing and the criminalization of vulnerable and marginalized communities. It is also why I worked with my colleagues, Representative Clark and Representative Tlaib, on legislation to protect those living in HUD public housing from this technology. More recently, school districts have begun to deploy facial analytics in school buildings and at summer camps, collecting data on teachers, parents, and students alike. Ms. Leong, how widespread is the use of this technology on children in schools? We're seeing facial recognition systems being implemented more and more in schools. I think the actual number is still very small in terms of percentage penetration of the number of schools in this country, but it's certainly spreading and growing. And it's one of the use cases we think is entirely inappropriate, that there's just really no good justification for a facial recognition system in a K-12 school. They're mostly being used in uh, security applications, sometimes in a sort of fear-driven response to school shooter scenarios and things like that, which, in my opinion, they do not adequately address uh, in any meaningful way and, and is not the best use of funds or the best way to heighten security around schools in response to those threats. The other part of your question, though, is the facial characterization um, programs, which I think are being used more and more in an educational context, where we're seeing systems that try to evaluate our students paying attention, what's the engagement rate, what's the response rate of students to certain teachers or types of teaching or things like that. Um, as I think was mentioned once earlier in the hearing by someone else, uh, that is based on very questionable data at this point, and I think in the uh, not ready for prime time category definitely qualifies in the sense that we're seeing it very quickly uh, applied in many use cases that the, the science and the research is not there to back up. And it's particularly concerning when you're talking about children in schools, not only because they're essentially a captive population, uh, but because the labels or decisions that might be made about those children based on that data might be very, very difficult to later challenge or in, in any way reduce the effects on that particular sure. child. Yes, yeah, serious uh, security and privacy concerns. Uh, Dr. Rahman, your study found that the error rate of facial analytics software actually increased when identifying children, is that correct? For most algorithms, that's correct. Okay, and why was that? Uh, we don't know the cause and effect exactly. There's speculation that uh, children's faces are, uh, have, with, with less life experience, there are less feature-rich uh, feature uh, uh, faces, but we don't know that for sure because uh, the, the convolutional neural networks that are used are, are um, it's difficult to, to make Got a it. determination of the reason. And many of you have mentioned in which these image databases can be vulnerable to uh, hacking or manipulation. Ms. Whitaker, when children's images are stored in databases, are there any unique security concerns that they raise or that may arise? Absolutely. Um, security for minors is always a concern. Okay. Well, this technology is clearly biased and accurate and even more dangerous when used in schools where black and brown students are disproportionately already over-policed and disciplined at higher rates than their white peers for the same minor infractions. In my district, the Massachusetts 7th alone, black girls are six times more likely to be suspended from school and three times more likely to be referred to law enforcement, again for the same infractions as their white peers. Our students don't need facial recognition technology that can misidentify them and lead them uh, to the school to confinement pathway. Last fall, I introduced the Ending Push Out Act, which would urge schools to abandon over-policing and surveillance and to instead invest resources in trauma-informed supports, access to counselors and mental health professionals, resources that will really keep our kids safe. In my home state of Massachusetts, a broad coalition of educators, civil rights, and children's rights advocates 
are leading the flight in saying no to the deployment of facial recognition technology in our schools, and I'm grateful for their activism and their solidarity on this issue. I would like to include, <clears throat> pardon me, for the record, a letter from the BTU, the NAACP, AFT Massachusetts, MTA, the ACLU Massachusetts, and many others urging our state to reject additional surveillance and policing in our schools.